Wayne's in rabbit hell for farmers, heaven for rabbit shooters. He's also truffle hunting as part of the trip to Gotland, field testing the new Aimpoint site over ferrets. You have quite a sniper there. <laughs> Dan Thor takes no prisoners at his friend Fred the Gamekeeper's shoot. But here comes Fred now, he's running across to us, look. Usain Bolt, here he comes, Usain Bolt is running. <laughs> Ryan Charlton from Highland Outdoors takes a look at and through binoculars from US optics company Maven. David brings you the news on the new stuff, while James has the best YouTube hunting films in this week's Hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. It's pretty much been exactly as I expected, to be honest. Quick, fast action, bolting rabbits out of holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you need to have the reactions. You need to be really, really fast. We love an infestation, so welcome to Gotland or Bunny Island, where a man with a ferret is everyone's friend. Here, the soft sandy soil of this land off the east coast of Sweden is so riddled with rabbit warrens, roads disappear and fields swallow tractors. Oh, <laughs> yeah. They, you, yeah, they'd go straight through that, wouldn't they? Yeah. yeah. Broken leg time. Yeah, exactly. On hearing about the quality of rabbit shooting here, Peter von Muller from Aimpoint thought it would be an ideal location to field test its new shotgun site, the Acro S2. Once again, we had to be sworn to secrecy as this site only launched at SHOT Show 2024 in Las Vegas, and we filmed this in September 2023. Now we can show you what a blast we had filming Wayne Martin, catapult supremo and proficient shotgun shooter, Felu, the French YouTube star who's come goose shooting with us before, and his talented cameraman and keen shot, Felix. Before we get stuck into the rabbits, our guide Anders has other hunting lined up for us. Truffle hunting with an Italian water dog. Apparently Milo's nose for the highly prized fungi was imprinted by feeding his mother truffles. The flavor passed into her milk. It actually worked too well. The first season, I uh, only got half truffles because they, they love truffle as well, also. <laughs> so he took the half and I got the other half. So uh, I had to make a plan for the next season. So uh, now I give him sausage, pieces of sausage, <laughs> and I get the truffle. It's a first for all the guests, and Wayne, who is wow. a big foodie, it's is over the moon at being one, able to hunt mm -hmm. for truffles. Never done anything like it. Never eaten truffle, never hunted truffle. And when they say yesterday we're going to go truffle hunting in the morning, I'm like, yes, that's right up my street. Right up that's my street. It, it's a real good addition to the trip. Yeah, yeah. really cool. Really, really cool. cool. <laughs> First truffle. Awesome. Success. Yeah. That's cute. Very cute. We'll eat that later. Yeah. Now, truffles are known to be expensive. <laughs> the going price for these is about £760 per kilo. So, it looks like it's Milo's round. Wild food will be a big part of this trip. Wayne has put in his list of ingredients for his rabbit dish, and Peter will be doing a homemade pasta dish with some of the truffles unearthed today. We're not sure who's going to cook the local Swedish crayfish in the lakes around our accommodation, as Felu confesses he doesn't really cook. That's what I've been brought up doing. I've been brought up as a hunter, as opposed to like a sports shooter or a pastime. You know, a hunter, we went out to hunt to eat. Adding more dimensions to that, as in like truffle hunting, going out and finding something that we can eat and put on whatever we shoot. You know, it's a fantastic experience. I loved it. Loved watching the lady work with her dog. How excited she got every time the dog found one, you know. They've probably done it a million times. The dog was 15 years old. But she was just as excited as probably the first time she ever done it. You can see on her face, you know, he found another one. It, yeah, it's awesome to watch. Our next outing is to the range. Both Wayne and Philu are familiar with the Aimpoint S1. This is the first time they'll be shooting with the all-new Acro S2. 
Peter zeroes the site on top of Wayne's Browning using a shell without the primer. You line the red dot up roughly with the rib. We've then got a clay set up at 30 metres, the red dot on the clay, and then we've got two cartridges, one on the top, one on the bottom, with the primers pushed out. And then you eye through the primer down the barrel and check that the clay is in the centre of the primer to check where your shot's going to place. So yeah, just zeroed it in without even firing a shot. The big difference is, is the housing, of course, but then also we increased the dot size. So on the S1, we had a six MOA dot. Uh, now we increased it to nine MOA. The people who tried the products actually got way better results with a bigger dot because it forces them to keep focus on the target instead of actually looking at the dot. The dot's there, but you're not supposed to look at the dot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I mean, uh, people always ask me, so why do you have a red dot? if you're not supposed to look at it. And my comeback phrase is always, why do you have the bead on the shotgun? It's a reference point. It's the way you know that you're on target. Tomorrow, it's the start of two days of rabbit shooting. For Anders, it's all about the ferrets. That's where his passion lies. So his name, sorry, her name? Joran. It's, a, it's not a she, it's a dude. It's a dude. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think there's a difference in work rate between the two, between the polecat and the uh, albino? Yeah. 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 Uh, the, the thing with the, the albino, he's slower. Right. But he, he's used to the dark. He's used to the dark. Yeah, they, they, are, they see really very bad, the albinos. Yeah. So when they're down under, they, I think they're, it's their environment more. So My dad thought he was dead one, one day. He was like, oh, your male is dead. I was like, no, he's not. Yeah, he's dead. And I went out and said, whoa, he, he's dead. <laughs> he he lies, lay, lay like that. Why and then I went that? out, took him up, and he was like, what are you doing, mate? <laughs> so he was sleeping like a dead. Yeah, yeah. Mine does exactly the same. He's, he's like a teenager, yeah. <laughs> my dad said. Yeah. <laughs> They take us to a farm that just can't function because of the rabbit damage. Injured livestock and machinery, rabbits have rendered this land useless. I know it sounds bad, but I'd love to have the numbers in the UK that they have here just driving in. They've, they've literally got holes. I mean, we're not talking burrows where you could net. There's just holes in the ground. The guys have a safety briefing to ensure that they and the ferrets are not in any danger. It requires a huge amount of concentration. Ferrets popping out can sometimes catch a shooter unaware. First hull and Wayne and Filiu are off the mark. Grab it! Reaction shooting, isn't it? No, Very yeah. much reaction shooting, yeah. Grab we it. shot that in within not even 10 metres, I think, from seeing it from the hull to bolting across. And it's not like clay shooting, you're expecting it to come out, you call, pull and shoot. You know, you're, you're at a cold start, you can't, stand, you can't stand there constantly with the gun like this. I tried it on the first one and your arm just goes dead, so you have to drop the gun after a while and become more relaxed. You know, you're within 10 metres of seeing it, it bolted out, we've sort of killed it. So, uh, yeah, very pleased. Open farmland is one thing, but the warrens under hedge lines and stone walls are another. We've got bushes here, bushes on the side, and we literally have a, a car width to try and shoot the rabbit within. Oh, come on, if one bolts across, you know, this is it. The challenge is on. So I, I reckon we've probably got three and a half metres, the ferrets in, okay? Yeah, yeah, three and a half metres, the ferrets in, and now we're going to have to be <clears throat> switched on. The one came out, but it didn't come across there we the go. road. I was right, you want to switch it Not one for eating that one, chaps. Oh, missed that one. Oh. No, I don't think so. I think it's gone for. Yeah. 
No way. Oh, you did, did get it? <laughs> <laughs> awesome job by you guys. That was a fun <laughs> rapid though. The bag is building, and at lunch, Anders and Wayne clean the rabbits. Here's a quick and easy skinning technique. Let's skin. After a wonderful lunch, we're off to the beach. Just a few hundred metres from the waves, Anders has another rabbiting permission. What a place. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Thank you. One particular Warren keeps delivering, and Wayne takes some great shots. This time, Wayne gets more than he bargained for. Fox, fox. It's a nice looking fox. <laughs> what a good first day. Peter chose this accommodation as much for the kitchen as the comfort. Tonight, Wayne is preparing dinner. So it's, it's rabbit, slow cooked in olive oil, white wine, garlic, lemon and rosemary. And just get a load of joints of of rabbit, it's such a simple dish to do. Uh, just fry them off in a bit of bit of flour, seasoned flour. Bang it all in a pan. <laughs> that sounds silly. Or bang it all in an oven dish, and then slow cook it in the oven for around about around about three and a half hours. And it just comes out. Obviously, the the, uh, the flour thickens the the wine and the olive oil, and it just comes out like a real a real thick, warm, hearty sort of winter dish. It's the the rabbit becomes like oily and juicy. The, it's the best way to eat rabbit, in my opinion. So I'm just hoping I can do it justice and uh, well, feed it to the guys tonight. I know, you've got quite an audience this evening. Well, we've got Mr. MasterChef, yeah. haven't we? So I'm, I'm sure he'll be critiquing later on, but we'll, we'll see what he thinks of it. Day two on the rabbits and Wayne explains the shells we're using. It used to be in Sweden you could shoot lead over water if the water was deeper than two metres, but apparently that's recently changed. So now by water you can only shoot bismuth or, or steel. So obviously we've been shooting rabbits by the water. We don't want to use steel because obviously steel ricochets. So when we're shooting down by the water, we're using bismuth and then we're using lead in land. As we've seen, there are a lot of decisions to make in a short time. Wayne lets one rabbit go, as you always have to consider the ferrets. Although I was on that one, I didn't pull the trigger because we've got two ferrets in and I can't see where the holes are, I can't see what's in the undergrowth. So although I was on the rabbit, I didn't know whether there was possibly a ferret lurking around it. There, there, exactly, exactly like that, see? The ferret's literally just come out and it's just in front of where that rabbit's just run through. So if I'd have pulled the trigger on that, I could have potentially shot the ferret as well. So we let the rabbit go, just in case. There's a lot to think about, isn't there? Because this is yeah. happening so fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you've got undergrowth like this, like I say, you can never be too careful. We know there's nothing behind, there's no people behind, but obviously nobody wants to shoot a ferret, do they? So. No, and also you're not allowed to shoot over the hole, are you? So you can't shoot the, the rabbits, even if they come and sit out by the hole, just in case there's a ferret just about to pop up behind it, which is obviously why the rabbit has come out. Again. bit of a convert when it comes to red dot aren't you? I really like it I really like it it's so easy to use I mean you, one thing I was looking at earlier on is you can adjust how bright it is this this red dot on the S2 is bigger than the S1 and it is actually a lot easier to acquire the dot faster what I found a good way is during the day is go up as bright as you can until the dot becomes blurry comes like a star shape when it goes too bright so you just adjust it back down to a perfect red dot and uh, you're golden 
Yeah, it's really good. And what's that? It's delicious. It's called ragmunk. Lunch is impressive and apparently typical for these guys. Well, what we got here then, uh, Matthias? Today we're having a chicken quesadillas, uh, ground chicken, some paprika, herbs, spices, smashed together with a lot of cheese. A lot of cheese? Yeah. And you prepped, prepped all this today, last night? No, last night. Got to it all last night ready for today? Yep. Then come down and cook it all out in the field? Yeah, quick and dirty. Quick and dirty. <laughs> Well, they're looking good and smelling good. Yep. So is this normal or are you just putting on a show for us? This is normal. Yeah? Yep. Ask Anders. But it's normally normal. Anders has three and Matthias has three. <laughs> One of the reasons I always invite Matthias to my hunts is because... <laughs> you don't like him really, but it's just because he's good with the food. Well, I, I do like him, but the food makes it even better. Okay. So uh, he has made um, pad thai and Ooh. he has made... Uh, it's called ragmunk and uh, it's put, it's a Swedish uh, like national course with pig. You dig pig? I dig pig. Everyone does. And uh, yeah, it's made sick foods. Like yesterday he made uh, uh, wild kebab for us and uh, it's always like that. He's a really good chef. Our last permission is a dairy farm. Anders shows us just how much damage the farmer endures here. A lot is hidden by the cover. It's not just the cows, because it, it, all the fields can look really healthy. And then suddenly when you go out with a tractor or a combine, or... A combine yeah. And then suddenly like the, the tire just sinks and can mess up the whole equipment. And that also happens sometimes. Okay. And then you get dirt in the food. You have, can't take, get that away. And, yeah, the farmers doesn't like rabbits at all. On the last two stands, Wayne pulls off some great shots. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Whoa, nice shot, mate. That was nice. <laughs> that was nice. A lot of our stuff we've been doing has been very much snap shooting. Uh, and you had a nice bit of time to put the gun on it. Pull a pull, sort of pull through it, pull the lead on it, and pull the trigger. I mean, probably 25, 30 yards. Yeah, yeah I'm very happy with that. Yeah, I've got to ask you, David, did you get it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, nice shot, mate. Show the distance there. Yeah, to show, show the distance, you know, just from there, the momentum that that rabbit has gathered from bolting from the hole. We've shot it here, obviously, as you can see, with all the, the fur, and it's probably flipped and rolled on at least another two and a half, two and a half metres, three metres. Now, as a ferret owner, Wayne is intrigued by the ferret box that Anders is carrying. He's concerned that the ferrets might cook in there. Put your hand on it. It's freezing cold. It's freezing cold? Yeah. Yeah. The thing is, you can't stand it in the sun with no wind. Yeah, yeah. But if it's wind, it goes through and it cools the metal down. It's aluminium. Yeah. So the thing is, in the winter, the ferrets are a little hotter than outside. So I can just put my hand there and check. And it's always like a little warmer than the where the, where the body heat comes through? Yeah. Yeah. So the thing is, I've used the wooden boxes. But Matthias made this just so it's so nice against your hip. Yeah. It just fits like that. And then... Uh, it doesn't weigh anything. It's been an exceptional few days and didn't they shoot well? Usually what happens is they don't even ha have time to react. I mean, Wayne, th there was one rabbit that came up in the air and he shot it in the air and it was dead before it left the ground. It was no like half shot, it was dead on. And I was like, that's a nice shot, man. I had to go and clap in on the back. I was impressed actually. It, same with Philou, he did amazing shots like, he could have been a born on Gotland shooting <laughs> rabbits, actually. 
If I were alone, there is a few shots that I would have take more time. But uh, you have quite a sniper there. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't like to say, but it got a bit competitive at some point. It's just like, oh my wow. god! <laughs> it was so really. I have to say, it's like uh, I, I used to have a, uh, to like a, a bit to be competitive. It's, it's nice when you hunt with friends and all that to uh, you know to have fun with that. Uh, but usually, I'm always the fastest, so it's not an issue. <laughs> um, but damn, I said, how we can do that? At the beginning, I was always uh, shotgun open. Yes. It, at the end, I said, what the fuck, I stay like that. <laughs> I won't shoot a rabbit in the day. If I'm that. <laughs> Merci, mon brave. Great sport, great company, and great shooting. And with an aim point sight that was made for the job. For more information about the new Acro S2, go to aimpoint.com. Thanks, Wayne, and all at Aimpoint for that. And you can see the Aimpoint guys on the Edgar Brothers stand at the British Shooting Show. Now, in this week's Field Sports Extra, we have the lawyer behind our new legal helpline for members, the former head of the League Against Cruel Sports, Pleasure. and a gloomy gun shop owner. They're digging things up from 35 years ago that have got absolutely no relevance to the person of today. The legal helpline is a new benefit we're bringing to our members to coincide with the British shooting show this week. Uh, we're also giving away a field sporter knife made by ADG Custom Knives to one lucky new sign up this weekend. Now to somebody else who should be on benefits, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. The UK Labour Party has been accused of mounting an attack on the countryside. The Countryside Alliance warns that in-government Labour's policies could decimate rural life. This week's announcement that a new government would eliminate hunting within their first term in Parliament has led to an outpouring of anger. Amongst the issues, Labour says it plans to eliminate trail hunting if it comes to power. The Countryside Alliance says it's starting a toxic culture war on the countryside. There's an element of deja vu here, with Labour wanting to return to the toxic culture war of 20 years ago, showing the party hasn't progressed at all since Tony Blair's leadership. The countryside won't be bullied, and we will stand up for ourselves. There's plenty to play for, and the Alliance will continue to fight to protect the interests of those who understand the countryside. Charlie joined the fight on GB News with a debate with an activist from PETA. Labour's statement seems to have triggered antis into an outpouring of hatred against country people. Up against a representative from an anti-hunting organisation, Charlie got the chance to fight back. Um, trail hunting is still allowed and when this happens, the hounds are often still ripping foxes apart limb from limb. In fact, there's been over 400 prosecutions of illegal hunting with dogs since 2010. Hunting was correct for a couple of things. He's managed to pack quite a lot of lies into a single sentence. Uh, hunting was not uh, banned, hunting was restricted, coursing was banned, and there have only been a handful of prosecutions. Uh, the 400 she's talking about are because the uh, laws that Tony Blair brought in were uh, stronger than the existing anti poaching laws, so police tend to use the Hunting Act instead of the old perfectly adequate poaching laws to uh, to prosecute people. So it's not quite as bad as she's making out. Um, it's um, so, yeah, go on, carry on. So, so why, so why do we, why do we defend it? Because hunting is fun. We love it. It's social. It's uh, economically beneficial. It's environmentally beneficial. And it, you know, if Keir Starmer wants to crack down with a hate campaign against the minority group, that's you know, it's his prerogative. It's absolutely fine. But I think we're reaching a point in the countryside. We're reaching perhaps the tipping point where you know we're just not going to put up with these urban attacks on what we do. A prestigious hunt has been banned from having its annual ball after online attacks by animal rights activists. The Marwell Hotel near Winchester in Hampshire was due to host the Hursley and Hambleton Hunt's annual celebrations next month. It cancelled the event after abuse from antis for supporting alleged illegal fox hunting. The hunt says it carries out legal drag and trail hunting in accordance with current legislation and says the hotel has caved into bullying by the antis. The bull was worth more than £8,000 to the hotel. It's now been rebooked by the hunt at another unnamed local venue. It's our detractors that are, you know, they're putting up fake reviews for businesses that quite frankly should be an offence. And there's no reason why these businesses shouldn't um, support 
their local hunts. I mean, they are their customers. One of the longest standing records in British angling has been broken. Lloyd Watson landed his 47 pound, five ounce pike from Chew Reservoir near Bristol. His capture beats the one held by Ray Lewis, whose record for a 46 pound, 13 ounce fish from Plandedford stood for 32 years. A hunt accused of illegally setting its hounds on a fox has been cleared to resume hunting. However, a ban remains for the two hunt masters. The Blackmore and Sparkford hunt was banned from hunting after a video published in the Times, which appeared to show its hounds attacking a fox. The BHSA has cleared the hunt to return to trail hunting for a probationary period. It will have to reapply for its license next season and prove it is hunting lawfully. Dorset Police is investigating complaints against the hunt masters after the alleged incident in December. A leading chef has hit back after he was asked to remove the word hunter from his game cookery business. Nick Weston teaches people skills he says equip them to become modern day hunter gatherers. Several events where he and his staff carry out game cookery demonstrations ask Nick to change his business name from hunter gather cook to remove the hunting reference for fear it might be upsetting punters. Nick, an author who also appeared on BBC's MasterChef as a mentor last year, announced on his social media that he'd refused. His parting shot on a robust Instagram post was to remind the antis, if we'd never been hunters, no one would exist now. A fundraising campaign to help a 12-year-old Cornish schoolboy rescue his fishing business has raised more than £2,000. Anthony Newcomb from near Plymouth lost his boat in recent storms. It meant he faced closing his business, which sells freshly caught fish, crabs and lobster. The local community started a campaign after Anthony found his lost boat smashed to pieces on the rocks. It's now heading toward a target of two and a half thousand pounds, which will help fund a new boat plus new safety equipment. You can find Anthony's YouTube channel and link to his GoFundMe page below. Landowners in Scotland are to be asked to follow a new code of practice when medicating grouse with grit. Grit containing a medicinal anti-worming chemical is used to help kill harmful parasites in the stomachs of red grouse. It's fed to the birds on the moors using strictly regulated and designated bait stations. Scottish ministers are drawing up a new code of conduct for the use of medicated grit as part of the Grouse Moor and Muirburn Bill. Castrate grey squirrels and cull the deer, then feed the venison to prisoners in British jails. That's the plan from the current government, according to reports in the Daily Telegraph this week. It's a strategy designed to help protect England's trees, which a study into net zero targets says are under threat. The report being considered by government says the deer population in the UK is at its highest for a thousand years. Grey squirrels also cost the economy £37 million a year. DEFRA is due to publish its new deer and squirrel strategy, which includes the use of chemical contraceptives in squirrel food to slow population growth. And finally, here's Charlie with love. Earlier on, we brought you his exchange with the PETA activist on GB News, but Charlie had the last word. You can ban hunting if you like, you can try to, but it's a bit like trying to ban snogging. You know, I just don't think you can, you can stop us from doing it. Snogging, like as in kissing. Yeah, he said it's as yes. likely to be effective as banning snogging. People oh, want to do it. We don't want that banned, we do not indeed. And to keep Charlie banging the drum for common sense and for snogging, then please drop by the Field Sports stand at the British Shooting Show and join up to the Field Sports membership. You may even get a peck on the cheek. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And David would be most grateful were you to like, subscribe, or both of those under this film. Next, it's the end of last season and Dan Thor has a pheasant shooting invitation. Instagram star Dan Thor is having trouble with wind. No, not like that. He's been invited to a driven day by his friend Fred the Gamekeeper and a strong breeze is affecting how the birds fly. On this first drive, the pheasants over his peg aren't making enough height for a sporting shot. Oh, there's plenty of birds in there, just the wind played a big factor in that one. i say birds flying into wind, yeah, they don't really like that, do they? But it was lovely to see a lot of birds. Guns in front took a nice few shots there, which was lovely to see. Yeah, it's Fred's shoe, um, he's in the line today. 
So far this year, he's, he's had some blinding days. He's reached his targets of 100 bird days to 150s, which is what he wanted. Um, everybody who have been here on let days have had a great day. He's had some lovely write-ups and, you know, hopefully next year he carries it on. Dan doesn't fire a shot on the first drive, but he's optimistic about the sport to come. This drive here, yes, it's normally pretty decent, to be fair. There's been some good birds come out of here all season. But like I say, Fred is fighting with the wind because he's coming from behind us taking it straight down the wood and he's bringing the wood out to us. But if the birds break out to the left, they might curl around us. Yeah, yeah we've got a spectacular view, so that, you know, we can't moan about that. Today, Dan has ditched his usual Maruku and is shooting an old favourite, Browning. This is a gun that I bought years ago, my Browning Hunter Elite B525. I tried to sell it years ago, years ago. I'd been in the gun shop for about, about a year and I thought, you know, do you know what, I'll bring it back. I shoot it well, so what's the point of selling it? So yeah, this is, now set up the same as the Miracle, so yeah, there's two guns now that are very similar, and yeah, I've, this year I've decided to take this out for a few days and just test it out, so yeah, it's been going really well so far. Dan shoots one nice partridge, but once again, he's more of a spectator on this drive. <laughs> I think my year this year, invites and bought days haven't gone to plan, if I'm honest. <laughs> but you know what, though? I will say that the wind is quite strong coming from behind us, and watching them birds take on number one and two, they were challenging birds, and I'll tell you what, the birds won. Here comes Fred now, he's running across to us, look. Usain Bolt, here he comes, Usain Bolt is running. <laughs> when they got out, come out in the wind, they just went, Wallop, straight down there. You would think I only put 50 partridges down this year, would you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got all of the neighbours. <laughs> As a regular beater here, Dan knows the shoot layout well, and he's hopeful the wind will work in his favour on the drive after 11s. Is. Two weeks ago when he was here, he took it out that way with the wind. And did they fly well? They really did. So at least this time, they've got to fly with the wind, haven't they? I'll tell you what, that wind was very fast. <laughs> That's a strong wind on that one. Managed three on that one, which was quite good. Really enjoyable. Uh, the birds spread across the line nicely there, so I think everyone got a shot there, and yeah, the beat has done a good job there. Really nice job. Dan's luck continues on the next drive. Then he is out of the action for a couple of drives. Finally, he's back in the middle of the line for the last drive of the day. Can't do everything for him, can we? Dan has had a great day, but he can't resist pulling Fred's leg one more time. <laughs> oh, no, but it has been blinding, mate. But yeah, I no, just okay. want to say thank you for a good day. That's <laughs> all right, mate. Not a problem. Yeah, I'm sure your sponsors are sponsored a bit more than that, don't they? <laughs> I think, Dan, you need it more than me. Uh, thank you, you're more than welcome, mate. It's been a pleasure, mate. mate. Thank you very right, much. You're and, welcome. Like, say, very kind, you mate. Thank you. You can follow Dan and Fred on Instagram, links below. And for more about Browning Guns, go to browning.eu. Thanks, Dan. Next, Ryan Charlton from Highland Outdoors talks optics. This is Maven's B1.2 flagship binocular. This particular pair is in the very, very popular 10 by 42 configuration. And they've been designed to be used. Whether you're glassing across mountains, whether you're bird watching, whatever you need your binoculars for, you're going to appreciate the quality of these. The bridge feels very, very smooth, as does the focus wheel. The body is magnesium, rubber armoured, so it's never going to feel cold, and it's always going to feel tactile. Maven have used their extra low dispersion ED glass in these and the picture is phenomenal. The colour fidelity and the edge-to-edge -edge clarity is exceptional. They've gone all out to make these as good as they can be, which is only fitting for their flagship. We've got metal eye cups, 
which again have neoprene overs making them very very comfortable to use adjustable diopter and we've got the loops here for the included neck strap also included in the box are lens covers one cool thing is remove this threaded insert from the front and they'll mount onto a tripod for exceptional stability so these are available from all Highland Outdoor stockists. Check them out today. Thanks, Ryan. And you can see Maven binoculars on the Highland Outdoor stand at the British Shooting Show this weekend, or to buy them, there's a discount voucher in the description below. Now from Kit to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington, it's Hunting YouTube. I've been trawling through the latest hunting and shooting videos on YouTube, and here's my pick of the best I've found this week. First up, this is an unusual angle on driven boar hunting, with an action camera strapped to a dog as it dashes through the forest and comes face to face with the boar. Here's a very different type of boar hunting. This one's from David of Predator Protection UK, sitting out the night in a very cosy hide with more tech than you can shake a stick at, and shooting them with thermal. Meanwhile, knife maker Alan from Denim Outdoors is doing things the hard way, stalking rodos in the pouring rain in North Yorkshire. It's too much for one of his cameras, but Alan sticks it out and gets his deer in the end. Here's the latest from the Jack Pike channel, beautifully filmed as always. Andy Crow is shooting high pheasants and partridges at the renowned Plasdynum shoot in Wales. Next, Johnny from TGS Outdoors is gushing with enthusiasm for a very different type of shoot in the Welsh mountains, a walked up day with Simon Reinhold and friends. Martin Jeminson of MJ Sporting is out in the woods after pigeons, trying out a budget priced 410 from Coffs in this film from the Strictly Shooting UK channel. Rabbit Express has their best day yet, ferreting a steep bank with dogs and nets on a windy day in the Lake District. And finally this week, here's a powerful film from Wild Strongholds explaining how trophy hunting has saved the Bukharan Markor in the mountains of Tajikistan, going from a population of 38 up to around 600 in just 15 years. Well, that's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the eye symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link, jamesm at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us on Facebook or Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Twitter. Uh, you can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain. It's out at 7pm UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing and goodbye. <laughs>